everyone. If you want to raise your hand, raise your hand. <laughs> if you don't want to raise your hand, raise your hand. OK, exercise done. Let's talk about layer 2 scaling. Um, so first of all, like, let's take a look at uh, existing layer 2 protocols. right? So there's. When we look at layer two protocols, right? When we look at things like Plasma, state channels, um, Raiden, the Lightning Network, uh, Plasma Prime, Plasma Cache Flow, um, all of these different flavors, there, there's two ways in which they are off-chain protocols, right? So the first thing about that can be off-chain is uh, data going off-chain, and. There's a couple of exceptions, which one is basically deposits. So if you're entering the system, that's obviously on-chain because you're entering from an on-chain thing. The second is exits, because if you're going off of the layer two to back to the layer one, that has to be on-chain. And there's disputes. So basically, if two people disagree, this is what you need the chain for in the first place, then kind of some kind of state that was off-chain goes on-chain. Right, so data off is the, one of the things that's being off-chained by existing layer two protocols. The second thing that's being off-chained is computation. Computation includes state transitions, it includes signature verification, it includes hashing, it includes zero knowledge proof validation if you're doing privacy inside the layer two. Like basically any kind of computations that are part of processing transactions, this needs to be off-chained as well. Right. So state channels, data off-chain, computation off-chain, the Lightning Network, data off-chain, computation off-chain, Plasma, data off-chain with the exception of one root every like minute or whatever it is, um, and uh, computation off-chain. Um, off so this is kind of the status quo of layer two protocols, right? Basically trying to kind of off-chain everything and use this to, to gain kind of larger security gains. Now, it turns, what if instead we look at um, a different kind of a layer two protocol, which basically instead of doing data and computation off chain, we focus just on doing computation off chain. And to kind of introduce this category of a layer two protocol, I'll start by looking at a layer two protocol for something much simpler than a transactions, which is running a computation, right? So let's say you have some computation uh, and that computation is on a fairly small piece of data, but that computation takes a really, really long time to verify. This could be a VDF, this could be verifying a bulletproof, this could be calculating the millionth Fibonacci number just because you care about it inside of a blockchain for some reason. It could be lots of things, right? Now, let's take a look at the specific case where you have some computation, y equals f of x, and you can represent that computation as starting with the input x and kind of chaining it through a bunch of smaller functions that each do one step, right? So each of these functions are kind of small enough that you can compute them within a single transaction. And so you have state and you kind of thread it through one function, then the next, and the next. And the amount of intermediate state in the middle is also going to be tiny. So how do we do a layer two protocol that convinces a blockchain of the result of this computation without doing everything off chain? So here's the technique, right? So you basically have a standard challenge response game. The submitter sends a transaction where they provide um, why they provide the output, but then they also provide this kind of trace of intermediate steps. So they say, what happens when you do the first uh, uh, computation on X, then what happens when you do the second computation, what happens when you do the third computation, and the submitter just takes all of these intermediate states, kind of puts them into a list, and submits this list as a transaction, along with a deposit. This goes on chain into a smart contract. Now you wait. Two cases. Case one, Nothing happens for a week. After a week, the submitter gets their deposit back, the submitter gets a reward, and the chain knows the result of the computation. And if the computation is, uh, if the submitter submitted a response that's correct, this is typically, uh, typically what would happen. Case two, what if the submitter submitted something incorrect? Then anyone can submit a challenge. And what a challenge is, is it's just an index, right? It's basically saying, oh, let's say we're gonna look at X and we're gonna run through these functions and we're gonna go until we find the particular point where we disagree with the original submitter. And let's say the point where you disagree is, say, point 47. You submit the index 47 
and then on chain the uh, ca uh, computation f47 is done and you just verify that one particular step so if you assume everything was correct up to that point, you run just that one step, does the next output match the result of applying the actual computation to the previous output? And if it doesn't match, then the challenger pointed to something that's actually wrong, and so you cancel that submission, and then you wait for someone to submit something else, and the submitter loses their deposit, and the challenger gets part of this as a reward, right? So a key observation here is that this game is very friendly to honest players, right? Because the um, reward that you can get is going to be fairly small, but the penalty for submitting something wrong is going to be very large. And if you challenge, then you basically have a kind of 100% chance of getting your reward. You get your reward pretty much immediately. So it's very friendly to the challenger, very unfriendly to bad submitters. Um, and if you assume that there are people who need the answer ahead of time, so people who need the answer before the one week, and so they're willing to kind of run the computation off chain, then like basically, like, as long as you have like at least some people that are willing to run the computation altruistically, then you, it's pretty much guaranteed that if, you, if a computation is incorrect, then it's going to get caught. Uh, so who here followed this? Okay, um, who here did not follow this? Okay, um, no, that, that, that's a good ratio, so we'll continue. <laughs> um, so let's talk about data availability, right? So this game is very friendly to the challenger and it's very unfriendly to bad submitters. And the reason is that it's all computation, computations off is on chain, or computations by default is off chain, verification is on chain, computation is deterministic, and so when you challenge, like, you know you're going to win. Now, data availability, right? So let's look at the other aspect of scaling, which is if you publish a big hunk of data, you need to prove that the data actually has been published, right? If you can verify that data has actually been published, then you can do everything you want with fraud proofs, you can do everything you want with like basically extensions of the scheme and it's all good and then you can add a bit of sharding on top and you know we've got a great scalability solution. Data availability is trickier, right? So the idea with data availability is, what if someone publishes a big hunk of data, so think of this as a block, and they publish the Merkle root, they publish the root hash of the block that everyone downloads, and then they publish part of the block. They publish some of the block, but they don't publish the whole thing. Maybe the block is valid, maybe the block is invalid, but because some of the data is missing, you'll never know. So, can we use an interactive game to solve uh, data availability, right? Can we use a game that says, step one, guy publishes block. Step two, if any piece of data is missing, someone challenges and says, hey, this piece is missing. And step three, if they're right, they get a reward, and if they're wrong, they wasted their money. So the problem is you can't. And the reason why you can't is because Data is the sort of thing where like you can't kind of pre like you can't kind of commit to the facts that it was published at a particular time, right? Like you can't actually prove to someone the data was published or what piece of what piece of data was published because if data is unavailable now, someone could just publish it after one second. So let's consider kind of two parallel worlds, right? And you don't know ahead of time which world you're in. In world one, you have uh, two participants. One participant is someone who published a block with some missing data, and the second participant is one of these challenges, challengers, right? Basically, it's one of these challengers who just goes and raises an alarm. And they say, hey, this piece of data is missing. Give me the piece of data. Stop being a bad block proposer. Um, and, and so they raise an alarm, and at time t3, the publisher just goes ahead and publishes the remaining data. The publisher just says, okay, okay, bro, you want the block? I'm gonna give you, give you the block. So this is world one. Now, world two. The publisher, was the, the block proposer, was the good guy after all. The challenger raised a false alarm. The challenger is just trying to, kind of, just trying to cause a big mess, and the challenger just says, okay, this block um, looks like I can download the data, but I'm just gonna pretend I can't. I'm just gonna like point to this, p this little index over here and I'm gonna say it's not there. 
Now, let's look at these two worlds, right? From the point of view of any actor that tries to download the block after T3, these two worlds look indistinguishable. So I'll let people kind of look at the slide and just kind of make sure that they understand this because it's a very important insight. Right? Unless you personally try to download this particular piece of data at that particular time, which you can't do because these are scalability solutions, so we're assuming the data being processed is larger than the data everyone can download, um, then if you weren't seeing it at that time and you only kind of looked at the data later, you have no idea whether the bad guy is the block proposer or the bad guy is the one raising the alarm. And so because of this, scaling of data is just not, not something that you can do as easily, right? There's this fisherman's dilemma where basically in this situation, you ask, what is the reward that V2 is going to get, right? Because the global system does not know which of these worlds you're in. And so in either case, you have to give V2 the same reward. If the reward is greater than zero, then you can just raise false alarms and kind of money pump the system. If the reward is zero, then you have a DOS vulnerability. Basically, like you could raise false alarms and force everyone to download everything. And if the reward is below zero, then like only altruistic actors are gonna be willing to do challenges. So there's a problem. So you might ask, well, it sounds like scaling data availability verification is impossible, but plasma and channels are possible. So how do, how do they do it? And the answer is that plasma and channels do not solve the data availability problem. They bypass it, right? So the way that plasma and channels work is they don't try to create global consensus on whether or not super linearly large sized pieces of data are available. Instead, what they do is they kind of push responsibility to the user. If you, as a user, decide that your counterparty, operator, whoever you're working with is withholding data, you just switch to someone else. And that's it, right? The system as a whole doesn't really need to care who's at fault. If you're working with someone, with some counterparty, and from your point of view, it looks like the counterparty is cheating by withholding data, you don't have to bother proving that to anyone. You just withdraw and you go switch counterparties. So pl um, plasma and channels, uh, the exit games rely on this principle that basically says kind of the most recent signature is truth, right? This is true in the channel, this is true in the plasma system. So if you own an asset, you prove it to the main chain by basically proving that it was sent to you and you, if you know that you did not sign a message sending the asset to someone else, then you know that no one has the data to challenge you, and so you know that you can withdraw the asset, right? So the data availability problem is being bypassed because in this case, you know that data consisting of a signature taking the asset away from you is not available because you never signed such a thing. So plasma and channels both kind of use clever tricks to bypass the data availability problem instead of solving it, um, and this is why they work. Problem is, these techniques do not generalize well. Um, case one, Uniswap. So plasma relies on this model that basically says every piece of state has to have an owner, and that owner is logically responsible for the state, and if that owner sees some, something wrong with their counterparties, that owner can take their state, withdraw it, and go somewhere else. Uniswap does not have an owner. Uniswap, it's just a contract. It's sitting there. Anyone can peacefully interact with it. There's no kind of single actor that logically has the ability to kind of make the decision to retaliate against some, some layer two counterparty trying to cheat them. Um, Account-based payments. So Plasma does not generalize well to account-based payments because unlike in a UTXO system, in an account-based system, you can change the balance of someone else's account in the upward direction without their consent. In a UTXO system, I cannot modify your UTXOs without your consent. In an account system, I can modify your account without your consent in the upward direction, but that's still modification. And so because of this rule, where basically account-based payments break this assumption that says the on an honest user knows what the last message is that they sent, and so a whole bunch of plasma machinery just breaks. Um, plasma cache depends on an assumption that dependency trees are kind of well behaved and a lot of things break it. So all of this kind of leads to layer two just not lending itself well to generalization and 
in many cases, having a complicated and radically unfamiliar developer experience. Like you do not have a crypto economically secure layer two thing that has the same user experience of just write a contract and publish it that you can do inside the EVM. So let's talk about rollups. So this is a, a, a picture from a blog post that I wrote back in uh, 2014. And at the time, I basically kind of came up with rollups and I came up with this idea and I immediately, like, I immediately just wrote it up in a post and did not think about it. So it turns out that I was very wrong to kind of not think about it any further. And so here's why, right? Basically, the reason why is because if you do these, uh, the, this kind of rollup mechanism, then you, data is still going on chain, computation is going off chain, but data is much cheaper than computation. So let's look at ZK rollup, right? So ZK rollup is, uh, I, I wrote this ETH research post about a year ago that's called kind of scaling um, tr to 500 transactions a second. And with the Istanbul hard fork coming next month, this will actually go up to about 3,000 transactions a second. Uh, so what is ZK rollup, right? Basically the idea of ZK rollup is that you have a smart contract and that smart contract stores a Merkle root of the state. That smart contract stores a Merkle root of everyone's balances. So you have this Merkle root, you have this contract, and you just put it on, uh, have it on chain, and it's there. How, how do transactions happen? Users send transactions, right? So users send transactions, but they do not send them to the blockchain directly. Instead, users send transactions to a type of third party that we can call um, a sequencer, and, or, or sometimes an aggregator. And the sequencer collects a bunch of people's transactions. And the sequencer takes their transactions and kind of smushes them together and creates a zero knowledge proof. And the zero, basically, the transactions are all kind of very tightly packed in this form where you only need about 12 bytes. You basically just need the from address, the to address, the value, and the fee. And you don't actually need the nonces and the signatures. You can just throw those away. Um, you can throw the signatures away. And you have a ZK snark. And what, the, what your zero knowledge proof proves is it proves two things. First of all, if you start with a state that has some Merkle hash, which is the same as the Merkle hash that's currently in the contract, and then you apply all of these transactions, then at the end, you have some, some particular different hash. So you prove what the new hash is. So that's the first thing it proves. The second thing that it proves is all the transactions have valid signatures. So, you have one single ZK snark that just basically verifies that all of these transactions are valid, and it also verifies that if you apply all of these transactions, you get the new state that has some new, some new root hash, and you can put it into this contract. So the relayer just publishes this kind of very compressed package along with a proof. They upload it, and inside of the contract, you, you're guaranteed to just have valid state roots, um, and for every transaction, the only thing that goes on chain is about 12 bytes of data that just represents kind of very compressed versions of the addresses and the amount of money that's being sent. So this is ZK rollup, right? Now, what is layer two here, you might ask? So first of all, computation is layer two because the computation that involves verifying signatures and calculating what the new state root is is not done by the blockchain. It's done by number one, the sequencer, and number two, everyone that just wants to have a local copy of the state so they can have, uh, so they can have an up-to-date state so, so that either they can become a sequencer themselves or so that they can withdraw. Um, the third thing that's off-chain is storage. So storage is something that is getting more expensive in Ethereum and is likely to get more expensive. So for example, in the Istanbul hard fork, the gas cost of S load is going up from 200 to 800. And like in general, we can expect kind of more gas cost increases for storage to come soon because the evidence shows that storage and long-term storage on a blockchain is very expensive. So storage rollups, they put the storage off chain. Now what do they leave off on chain? A small amount of data. And data is something that's becoming cheaper in the next Ethereum hard fork. The gas cost of data is going down from 68 to 16, and it might go down more in the future. So ZK rollups, they do the, cheap, the stuff that's cheap on chain, which is data on chain, and they do the stuff that's expensive, 
like storing state, like uh, do, uh, even just doing computation off chain. And with rollups, you can get quite a lot of scalability. Um, so you can go down to about 748 gas, th theoretically speaking, now, and after Istanbul, you can go way, way lower. Um, optimistic rollup. So optimistic rollup is kind of different from ZK rollup, but it does the same thing. And the main difference in optimistic rollup is that instead of having a zero knowledge proof, you just provide the block, and whoever submits the block, they provide a deposit. And then you, prov you provide your block, you provide your deposit, and you wait a week. And during that week, anyone can challenge a block and they can say, this, this block has been calculated incorrectly. And if they say this, then they have to provide a couple of extra wit uh, witness data, so you have to provide some Merkle branches, and only that specific block gets executed on chain. And if that block turns out to be invalid, then whoever submitted it gets their deposit destroyed, and the, sub the challenger gets some reward, that block gets reverted, and everything after that block gets reverted. If a bl blocks do not get, get, get successfully challenged for a week, then the block is finalized. So it does the same thing as ZK rollup, where inside of the smart contract, the only state variable that you store is like really just the current block hash and maybe a couple of older block hashes. And storage is done off chain and computation is done off chain, except the enforcement mechanism, instead of being a ZK snark, is an interactive challenge response game. Right? So snarks and interactive challenge response games are, in many cases, competitors. Um, so the one other thing that optimistic rollup needs to be efficient is signature aggregation, and BLS has really nice signature aggregation. So this is kind of the one thing that you have like a very specialized kind of compact proof for. ZK ZK rollup. So this is basically ZK rollup, but where the thing inside the ZK rollup is uh, itself privacy-preserving transactions. Um, so since uh, we have to name like. Uh, uh, name new scaling protocols after states of matter. Um, I've decided that we should call ZKZK ZK rollup a Bose-Einstein condensate, so spread it, spread it around. Um, right, so statistics, right? Ethereum gas limit, 8 million, cross that out, it's 10 million now. Um, everyone give a round of hands to the miners for raising the gas limit. Um, block time, 13 seconds. So we can compute the theoretical maximum of a rollup. Um, this is pre-Istanbul 759 um, gas per transaction, or sorry, 748 gas per transaction, 759 transactions per second. Post-Istanbul, it goes up to 3228. These numbers are out of date because the gas home is 10 million, so it goes even higher. So we've already seen 100 transactions per second on chain inside of a ZK rollup. The main bottleneck is snark proving. And so if we see more kind of ZK snark based layer, like hybrid layer two applications, it's very possible that ZK snark proving like basically is going to become the next kind of mining. Now it's not going to be anywhere close to as lucrative as, as the current kind of mining, but it, it is possible that it will turn into like a pretty substantial economic activity that could even capture a substantial portion of transaction fee revenue. Um, so, other benefits of, of hybrid layer two protocols. Almost no on-chain state, so they're robust against state rent, increased gas costs for state, uh, um, relatively easy to implement as a system inside Ethereum 2. Um, Rollups relatively get better post-quantum because post-quantum signatures start to suck, um, but data is something that's expected to continue getting cheaper over time. Um, get relatively better with privacy, so privacy tends to involve a little bit more data, but a lot more computation. And so if you're layer twoing the computation, then um, opt rollups are even better, relatively speaking, for privacy-preserving transactions than they are for regular transactions. So a lot of uh, kind of really good uh, benefits from using these kinds of hybrid layer two protocols, right? So basically, keep your data on chain, do your computation off chain, keep your state off chain, and you're doing the most expensive stuff off, ch off chain, so you get most of, uh, most of the scaling benefits, but because instead of relying on these weird data availability workarounds, you're just were, uh, you relying on an interactive computation game or a zero knowledge proof, 
the protocols become simpler, the, protocol, the protocols become more tractable, and it becomes much easier to make the protocols be general purpose and basically just be copies of an Ethereum virtual machine or whatever other state transition system you want. So there's a lot of benefits of going in this direction. Um, there's also kind of hybrid routes that we can look at. So we can look at plasma systems that kind of pl use plasma to process payments, but then kind of go over and use um, uh, roll-up style techniques to process anything more complicated than payments. Um, roll-ups and sharding. Uh, so Ethereum 2, um, phase one is sharded data. And phase one, it will get sharded data even before phase two, which is sharded computation. Um, sharded data is a lot of data, um, potentially uh, multiple megabytes per second being processed by the consensus. And who here can multiply, uh, divide multiple megabytes per second by uh, the block time of, uh, uh, or, or sorry, by the, uh, the 12 bytes you need to send a roll-up transaction? The TPS of roll-up on a scalable blockchain is very high. Um, so another nice thing you can do with roll-ups is if you have multiple shards and these shards are kind of staggered, then you can have a roll-up system where after the fact, you go and kind of take information together from, some, from different shards that are communicating asynchronously with each other, but clients can verify ahead of time that this transaction got included anywhere and so they should treat it as being, fi uh, as being final. And so if you have multiple shards, you can theoretically kind of take advantage of that to achieve near zero block times. So one more benefit of, uh, uh, of the roll-up mechanism. Um, hybrid on-chain data uh, challenges, fee markets. So fee markets are kind of challenging for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, basically, if users kind of live inside of roll-ups, then they don't have like basically ETH on-chain. Right? And so users do not have ways to pay fees directly to miners. Instead, they have to basically go talk to relayers. And relayers are collect transactions, they make the big blocks, and they send the big blocks over to the block proposer who actually includes them on chain. So these are intermediaries, right? And they take a bunch of transactions, they aggregate them, and they publish a big thing onto the blockchain. Challenge is, well, analyze this market. Is this a market that tends towards centralization? If it does tend towards centralization, are there market incentives to avoid censoring? If you start censoring, does that, does that mean that someone else who doesn't censor can outcompete you? Are there risks that are associated with this? So still a lot of things to analyze. Um, but you know, there's wonderful teams that are working to analyze and think about these problems and propose solutions now. So conclusions, right? So, Basically, like hybrid layer two scaling, I consider to be this kind of pragmatic, short-term, moderate, and long-term kind of excellent on, to on top of sharded blockchains um, scaling paradigm. And theoretically, rollup can be implemented and deployed to create kind of near EVM equivalent contracts basically now. And even on the existing Ethereum chain, you would be able to get these scalability benefits and you would not need to rely on the base chain for storage or for computation. Um, and like you can do this and you can get a lot of scaling. And we can basically kind of help to alleviate the scaling kind of pressure that we've seen on existing blockchains up to now and give us a nice one to two order of magnitude boost that will basically take us all the way until sharded blockchains are working and perfected. When sharded blockchains are working, the good news, sharded blockchains and roll-ups are not competitors. Sharded, blo sharded blockchains and roll-ups stack on top of each other and multiply. You can have a roll-up on top of a sharded blockchain and megabytes per second divided by 12 bytes a transaction gives you very, very high TPS, even higher TPS than you can get with just raw sharded blockchains uh, running natively. So, a lot of opportunities short term and a lot of opportunities long term and in general kind of a very good path to scaling applications on, on Ethereum and helping to just make, blo make blockchain stuff that's both scalable and general purpose and without people needing to kind of go off into a corner and learn completely new development paradigms. Thank you. Mm-hmm.
Any questions? Um, so I have a question related to the when you really deploy all these things, but deploy and also the market happens happens. Um, do you imagine that there will be multiple relayers, mm -hmm. centralized or decentralized, mm -hmm. but there are going to be one giant smart contract on the main chain that contains everything? Or you imagine that somebody would fragment all the smart contract on the main <coughs> chain and the multiple relayers talk to multiple smart contract? So basically, is there going to be one roll-up system or many roll-up systems? Exactly. And that's yeah. basically, there's different economic incentives, mm -hmm. different market analysis, everything would happen. Yeah, and no, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think, uh, like, there's definitely economic arguments for why kind of having one roll-up chain can have benefits, but then there's also arguments for multiple roll-up chains. So, like, for example, a big one would be that if you have one roll-up chain that's doing 1,000 TPS, then in order to stay up to sync with it, you would have to do 1,000 TPS on your machine. Whereas if you have 100 roll-up chains that are each doing 10 TPS, then it's easier to kind of just join the ones that you care about. Um, if we have multiple roll-up chains, the main challenge is just moving between them. Because like, withdrawing from a roll-up chain takes a week, and you don't want it to take a week to move between different chains. But that's something that you can speed up if you have kind of basically like layer two liquidity markets where you just kind of do like, like do off chain like fancy DeFi lending and uh, and and so you can kind of allow people's exits to uh, turn into deposits on other chains immediately. And if you do that, then I, mean, I think you can remove that downside. So as a follow up question on that, on the answer is because if you want to have one roll up chain you pretty much force everybody, every user has to deposit the tokens into that real up smart contract. Mm -hmm. Technically, you remove every user from the main chain, all goes to one the real up chain. Mm -hmm. Is that what you imagine would happen? So you actually imagine I, user? Um, I don't think that would be that bad, right? So like, there's already a lot of smart contracts that have, I mean, there's already a lot of single smart contracts that have very high market share, right? Like, individual ERC-20s have like high market share uh, on as far as like what percentage of Ethereum transactions they consume all the time. I mean, sometimes like single applications blow up and single-handedly consume $50 million of transaction fees. So and I don't think it's the worst thing. Uh, Sir, continue to follow up. The question is here is if you imagine every address being deposited in a smart contract would that affect the performance scalability? It's like you have a 10 million, one, 10 million user address in that smart contract. That's kind of the whole yeah, roll up. Yeah, so I mean, there's definitely a rationale for roll ups to kind of limit the, the number of transactions that they accept. Like if there is a thousand TPS happening inside of a single roll up, then yes that roll-up is going to be difficult to work with, even if it's on a kind of ultimately a, a chain that can, run, that can run the data by itself just fine. Um, so there is possibly rationale for roll-ups um, charging fees. So for example, roll, it might make sense for roll-ups to charge um, storage rent because storage size is something that you would want to mitigate because if the storage gets really big, then it would take a long time to just t to even fast sync your way into a roll-up state. And so um, roll-up hybrid layer two scaling solutions definitely do have the ability to collect transaction fees. And like, this is actually interesting because when you can collect transaction fees, then you have the ability to kind of potentially take that revenue and like do interesting and fun things with it. Like you could use that revenue to fund like Moloch DAO or Gitcoin grants, quadratic funding or whatever. And I think that would be really cool. Hmm. Hey, are you worried about um, composability, especially with roll-ups? Because I know you, you wrote a blog post mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago. Like, hmm. you can't do one thing on one shard, then another thing on another shard, and then have the original shard mm -hmm. depend on things in the second shard. And it yeah. sounds like that's going to be even more complicated with roll-ups now. No, this is definitely, like, the biggest argument in favor of more things happening on one single roll-up chain. Because um, if you don't have one single roll-up chain that everything is uh, kind of inside, then... Like basically, 
in order to do like cross like in order to do like atomic like, transactions between different objects, you basically have to just do the yanking technique. Like you move them onto the same roll-up chain, and then inside of that roll-up chain, you would just you would make a block, um, which is definitely something that you can do. I mean, okay, theoretically, there's like even other kind of spooky things that you can do, such as like you might be able to design rollups so that you can, there's like conditional data dependencies, like data A is only valid if data B is in the other rollup block and then you submit them together. But if you don't do that, then you'd have to move things onto the same rollup and then atomically do them in the same rollup and then go and do whatever you want with the assets after that. I don't think there's really a way, like a good way to do things other than that kind of paradigm. Hmm. So I may have misunderstood this, but it kind of feels like there could be one roll of chain that goes over multiple shards. And mm -hmm. if the cross shards communication is not synchronized, then this can actually kind of almost kill the benefit of sharding in terms of scalability. Why? Um, if Because current design of the cross shard transaction, mm -hmm. there's no bounded time on when this transaction gets finalized. Right. So if you think about the latency of one transaction being proposed to the finalized as mm -hmm. the kind of a throughput measurement, um, then having this roll up going over multiple shards can actually make things worse in terms of the things that could have been finalized in um, in like one single shard could have to go through the roll up that mm. ha now has all the cross shards communications involved. Like, so, wouldn't that actually kind of? So there is some good news here, which is that you can have roll ups that provide like fast cross shard transactions internally, even if base layer cross shard communication takes like a very long time, like even multiple days. And the reason is because it's an optimistic system, right? Because like even if it take like you need to kind of take Merkle roots from different shards and then put them together and like figure and fit everything in together into one piece in order to figure in order to figure out the state and like convince the kind of central contract of what the state of the entire system is. Like even if that process takes a really long time, clients can locally predict what that output is going to be immediately if they know what, what got included into different shards. Right? So if shard, if shard talking to shard is slow, but shard talking to client is fast, then you can have optimistic systems where client knows what's happening on both shards. And so the client knows immediately what the result is going to be when the communication system on the chain finishes. And so because of this, like the layer two system can basically have, like, can kind of show to the user a very, a very fast cross, cross shard experience. So this is actually one of the things where rollups can help. Hey. Hey. Um, so what challenges do you mainly see in DeFi at this point? And um, Outside of blockchain, what other DOTs do you see with great potential in terms of scalability and um, security, I'd say? Outside of blockchain, what DLTs do I use? I mean... Yeah, like there's DAG, there's... I guess Astra. to me that doesn't compute because I use the word blockchain to refer to crypto economic systems in general. But um, I mean, like even ETH2 by itself, right, is not a blockchain in that sense because you have like shard graphs where, where different shards talk to other shards, so it's not even a chain, it's like a complicated weave thing. Like, yeah, I mean, like to me, I think, like it's the, the like what kind of chain structure a system has internally doesn't really matter. What matters is the properties that it provides. And if you can provide scalable crypto economic consensus, then like I think that's all great. I mean, I don't know, I like quadratically sharded chains. I just think they're kind of nice and simple and kind of the logical centralization of like having kind of spoke chains that talk to a hub is like great and wonderful. And I, mean, I know there's other systems too, but I feel, I, don't know, I feel like things are kind of converging on something that's reasonably close to being optimal at this point. Thank you. Thank you.